science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and a science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. Put on your lab coat, put on your safety glasses, and hold on to your tail. This is the Science Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. The day you listen to this is the day Chris and I and Adam are heading up to the TELUS world of science to put on a science talk about social media, kindness, science, and empathy. I think most people are going to come to see Bunsen and Beaker, but it's pretty exciting to go to another science center and give a talk about the importance of science communication. The snow has continued to fall. Cross-country skiing has occurred, snowshoeing has occurred, the dogs love the snow, and it's warmed up, and even Chris is enjoying this winter, (laughs) this very early winter. Okay, what's on the show this week? In science news, we're going to take a look at stupid daylight savings time. It's dumb, it's bad for us, let's talk about it. In pet science, we're going to take a look at another study, yet another study that found out that when you pet dogs... It's good for you. So we just need to get rid of stupid daylight savings time and pet some dogs, I guess. That's 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 what's on tap for the show today. <laughs> Our guest and ask an expert, this is so wholesome, is Dr. Shelley Volsh, who's going to talk to us about dog laughter. Hey, dogs, did you hear that there was a man that died of laughter? The authorities found out the cause of death was a killer joke. <laughs> okay, on with the show. There's no time like... Science time. This week in science news, let's talk about daylight savings time. It's over. Hooray. We got an extra hour of sleep a week ago, and we are now in standard time. Most places in North America do this spring ahead, fall behind kind of business, except for Saskatchewan, which is our province to the east. They just don't do anything. (laughs) Um... And uh, there is a there's a lot of problems with daylight savings time. And I thought I'd go over the current research on what it is. So first, we're going to look at what Kenneth Wright said. Kenneth Wright is a sleep and circadian expert at the University of Colorado Boulder. When you go into daylight savings time, you don't actually save any light. The, The thing about daylight savings is you just change how you live relative to the sun. When we change when the sun is at the highest point in the sky, our schedules are messed up. Now, you may not think the sun affects you, and are we getting into woo-woo territory with astrology? No, the planets and the the stars in the night sky don't affect you, but the big ball of burning fusion certainly does. Okay, it doesn't burn, but it's a fusion ball. Um, It does biologically. We have evolved, and there's many studies to show this, that we have a cycle of light and dark. So that cycle of light and dark allows us to go to sleep and it allows us to wake up. Morning light, so the light in the morning is pretty critical for most people to wake up. When we went to standard time and we fell behind and I woke up and it was bright outside, I sprung out of bed. I had so much more energy. And from a health perspective, that's what we should be looking at is what is the effect of daylight savings time when we spring ahead? Okay, so why is it important to have a proper circadian rhythm with the sun? The exact reasons maybe aren't known. There are a couple good pieces of data. Sunlight has an effect on levels of cortisol and that cortisol is a stress response. And the less sunlight you get the more cortisol is made. Exposure to light in the evening also delays something called melatonin. So if you are waking up when it's dark and you're trying to go to sleep when it's light, that's a big problem for sleep. Melatonin helps you sleep, helps cause drowsiness. Teenagers are really affected by all of this. Um, Puberty causes melatonin to be released much later, as much as two hours later. It's probably why some teenagers have such problem falling asleep. Compound that with the fact that they're trying to fall asleep with it when it's light out. It's just a mess. And as well, if they're trying to wake up when it's dark, there's also good evidence to show that teenagers and, and kids just need more time to wake up than an adult. 
and uh, and the lack of sunlight can affect them even more trying to wake up. I have long said that we are sending the kids, we are sending kids to school way too early. Like there are some school districts that start at 8 a.m. Adam's got early morning band at like 730 in the morning and school starts for us at 830. Like I think kids should be like getting to doing school at, at 930. And of course, like I gotta extend the day, so we'd be go- we'd be going in a little bit longer in the afternoon. But it just gives kids longer to sleep and more time to wake up. Now, of course, there'll be people that say springing ahead is good. There's more light in the evenings. There are some weak weaker studies that show there's less collisions with deers. Um, but the overwhelming amount of also car accidents that go up that day in the morning from sleepy people probably negates any crashes with deer. The big reason to stick with standard time is that it's as close as possible to when the sun is at noon overhead. In in daylight savings time from March to November, it's unnatural for us. The good thing is that there is more and more public pressure to do something about this. Like, it's an easy thing to vote on and change. Like, why do we have to have daylight savings time? If it's bad for us and there's no good reason... As John Oliver says in one of his videos, why is it still a thing? And I agree. We probably should stick to standard time. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, it's all about petting your dog. This wholesome study comes to us from the University of Basel's psychology department. The study looked at how petting a dog affects your brain. So a little bit of background. Your brain has something called the prefrontal cortex. And it allows you to process things like emotions and executive functioning, like attention and memory and problem solving. So the team of researchers wanted to see how petting a dog affected this area of the human brain specifically. 21 lucky volunteers. Well, not so lucky because they had to have their brain scanned. (laughs) 21 volunteers had their brain scanned while they were in contact petting a dog or a stuffed animal, or staring at a wall. (laughs) Can you imagine if you came to the study hoping you'd be one of the dog petting people, but you actually just had to stare at a wall? (laughs) Their brain activity was measured using something called near-infrared spectroscopy. It, It basically measures how much oxygen your brain is using. The stuffed animal is placed on their thigh so they could see it, and then they pet it. And the dog, the dogs that were part of the study were really well trained. They would lie down on a couch. The real dogs that were part of the study would lie down and uh, they'd be touching the participant and the participant was allowed to touch and pet the doggy. So what did they find? The data from the study was pretty interesting. So the brain activity in the prefrontal cortex went up in the people that were petting the stuffed animal versus the wall. And it also was way, way up in the people that were petting a real dog. But what was what was most interesting is that the second time around, the second time the uh, the the participants petted the stuffed animal, the activity went down in the brain and the activity in the brain went up when it was a real dog. And one of the hunches the researchers have is really wholesome. People were engaged the first time petting the stuffed animal and perhaps they were thinking of different times where they petted a real dog. And the second time they're like, you know, this is just a stuffed animal and I feel kind of silly petting it. But the hunch with the real dog is so wholesome. The second time around, there was more brain activity because the participant was making a bond with the dog. There was more emotional investment in the dog. Therefore, attention went up. Therefore, more prefrontal cortex activity. This is yet another study that shows that petting a dog, being around a dog, helps with things like attention or anxiety or regulation. In schools, dogs that are therapy dogs do wonders, as in workplaces and hospitals. This study just shows more evidence that there are effects on our bodies because of dogs. That's Pet Science for this week. Hey everybody, before we get to the interview section, I thought I'd let you know how you could help out the Science Podcast. The Science Podcast will always be free to download. You'll never have to worry about paying for it. But here are some ways that you can help us out. Number one, check out the merch store, www.bunsenburnerbmd.com. 
the merch store has adorable gear, the beaker stuffy, and now text from Bunsen. Number two, think about joining the Pawpack community. It's going to be replacing Patreon, so thank you Patreon supporters, but if you aren't part of the Paw Pack, we'd love for you to join. Our new community will take what we do on Patreon and supercharge it. There's going to be so many cool perks to joining the Paw Pack community. Look for it in the next couple weeks. Third, think about reviewing the Science Podcast on a podcast player and giving us a great score. It really helps. Back to the interview. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast, and I have Dr. Shelley Volsh, Clinical Assistant Professor of Anthropology with me today. How are you doing today, Doc? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm good. We've been playing tag to do this over the last like month, I'd say. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you. Same, and thank you for having me. You betcha. Where are you in the world? Where are you calling into the podcast from? I am in Boise, Idaho. Um, it is not just potato farms like you might think. <laughs> and Boise, um, Boise. Yeah, yeah. No, I, um, I'm i in Boise. I actually live downtown where we call it the Treasure Valley because there's this beautiful river that runs through. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm lucky enough to live right off the river, which is nice because I get to see all of the people and their dogs walking on the Greenbelt. Wow. I have been to Boise, Idaho many times. Um, my my family would vacation every couple summers in Sandpoint, Idaho, and then we always oh. went to Boise. Yeah, so I'm familiar with what you're talking about. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Well, the next time you come down here, maybe you'll have to live, visit the lab. Oh, sweet. I'll bring Bunsen and Beaker. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I introduced you as Dr. Shelley Volsh. Volsh. Um, what's your training in science? So my training in science is a little haphazard compared to what a lot of people um, think of. I we, actually we didn't like, start. We like haphazard. We like that. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Because life doesn't normally go as planned. And that's usually a pleasant surprise. Yeah. Um, so when I was in high school, I was really interested in biology. Um, but this was quite some time ago. And mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the time at that time, if you weren't really great at math, especially if you were a girl, you just kind of said, OK, I'm not going to get to go into STEM. Um, and so mm -hmm. even though I had all this interest in how things worked and animals, um, I just kind of let it go for a while. And I had some um, stops and starts along the way. But about uh, 12 years later, after I graduated high school, I went back to school. Um, so I had been a dog trainer for 10 years. And I had done a lot of work, um, you know, teaching other teaching other dog trainers to take the certification test for the CPDT, okay. and running classes and doing behavior work. Um, my specialty was my dog tried to eat my neighbor kind of stuff. <laughs> so, um, or my dog tried to eat my other dog. That was the other one I saw a lot of. Oh my god! Um, and so I decided I was going to go back to school. And my long term goal at that time was, oh, I'm going to become an animal behaviorist. I'm going to be like Patricia McConnell, right? So I was getting my degree in psychology, and I took biology and all these other classes, and I was loving it. And I was thinking, oh yeah, neuroscience, and we're going to do all these cool things in grad school. Um, and then my senior year, I took a class that was an elective called Dogs, Cats, and Other Beasts, Anthropology what? of Animals. You have classes called that where you went to school? Oh, yeah. That oh, is yeah. amazing. So as I was taking this class, I'm like, there's a whole world to human relationships with our companion animals that I had never knew existed. I thought your choices were do training and behavior or become a veterinarian, <laughs> right? Yeah, okay. Um, and so I took this class and I was like, I love this. And I started talking with the professor and I'm like, I want, this is what I want to do. I want to research these types of things. I'm, I'm really fascinated. You know, I know how to train the dogs. It's the people that I need more understanding of. <laughs> um, there's actually a great book by Reese Van Fleet that's called, it's not the dogs, it's the people. So oh, I've heard of this book. Yes. Um, anyway, so and I might have misquoted that. It might be Nicole Wilde. Anyway, so I took that class. Um, it was the fall semester of my senior year of undergrad, and I started attending his lab meetings in the spring, and I decided I was going to go to grad school for anthropology, which meant my entire spring senior year was all anthropology classes, so I had enough credits. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I just delved into this world of, you know, evolution of cognition and, um, you know, behavioral biology and and understanding cross-cultural differences and what's nature and what's nurture and all these wonderful things. 
And since then, you know, when I once I graduated, I was able to really start exploring uh, a range of interests and trying out different, you know, methodologies. And so I would say that I've dipped my hands in a lot of little things to figure out where I'm going to get to. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I'm really enjoying uh, where we are now, which is, you know, I'm, I study ecology and evolution of behavior. Um, I look at comparative you know, human animal, um, especially human dog coevolution type stuff. How does that impact our communication? How does that impact our relationships in the home? Um, and I just, I don't know, I, I encourage people to follow the breadcrumbs, even if it means a little bit of a lane change, because you just never know where you're going to end up. Oh, I love that. You should, that should be on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Help our lab make some money. <laughs> did, uh, did you always like animals when you were young? Like this, you got into oh, yeah. dog training. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did you Oh have- yeah. I actually, I grew up on a small farm, a little hobby farm in Wisconsin. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and so we like, had horses and as you do in Wisconsin. Yes. Yes. And I had, you know, we had horses, we had goats, we had dogs, we had cats, we had chickens. We had a pig one year who I was not allowed to name because I was watching Charlotte's web too much at the time. And my parents didn't think I would let him leave. (laughs) Okay. Um, So yeah, I was actually prepping one of my classes this morning and going through old pictures to kind of show them like, you know, sometimes, Sometimes that thing that you that dream that you give up as a that was a kid's dream, right? You kind of give that up, but it becomes it kind of comes back around to what really makes you happy as an adult. So I have these pictures of me with, you know, a ten years old holding a dog, or um, you know, twelve years old holding a, a miniature horse on its halter and lead, and oh. so yeah, I love it. I love it. So your research, like your research has delved into the human animal bond and you mentioned specifically dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, what what are some things that you have found that you'd think would be interesting to folks? So the first thing that I found that I think would be interesting to folks is that um, for those of you who feel like you're kind of a parent for your dog, um, you know, you think about the stories that we tell, the pictures that we share, uh, you're not imagining it. Um, so from an evolutionary perspective, we have this thing called alloparenting. It's something that is kind of central to human behavior. Um, and because of that, we want to care for others, right? Alloparenting just means uh, that, you know, caring for somebody who's not the biological parents caring for offspring, whether that's our, mm. our children, our nieces and nephews, or for a lot of us, our companion animals, our dogs, our cats. I once spoke with a bunny mom. Um, which was a great conversation. Yeah, <laughs> I was that, like, I never thought of bunnies that way. Rabbits are cute. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, you know, we had, we have this natural desire and need to nurture. And that doesn't always mean parenting. Parenting can be a flexible thing in our current world. Um, you know, economics and all these other things that we'll let the politicians talk about. Um, those things are all having an impact. And so some people are choosing to have one child. Some people are choosing not to have any. Some people are simply choosing to wait until later in their lives. Um, And so when you bring this together, we're just seeing that people are taking what would be your natural parenting strategies, right? Thinking, investing in more time with your companion animal or spending more time teaching them and having fun with them or, you know, maybe spending more money on the veterinary bills than we would used to 50, 60 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's natural and it's okay. And for those of you who are out there that are the crazy dog moms and dog, you know, dog moms and cat dads, um, you're not alone. And it is, from what I can tell, normal. And we should we should accept it as just part of the human behavior. Unless, of course, you're a Taylor Swift type that has like 30 cats in their videos, then that's another thing. <laughs> I will always remember that commercial. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I believe um, I believe I remember that commercial. That is a lot of cat wrangling. Whoever that, is in charge of all of all of yes those cats. Is. Yes, it um, is. <clears throat> Shelly, is this a new phenomenon? Like the like I want to say t- even 20, 30 years ago, nobody used the word dog dad or dog mom or cat mom or cat dad. Um, do, do, do you get where I'm going with this? I do. And and I think that, so as far as the word, as far as the marketing, yes, it's new. I think that when PetSmart and some of those other big box stores started to pick up on, wow, people are being this way with their animals, let's market it. 
Um, I remember I was like, it was like just after I graduated high school, there was an article that had come out in one of the newspapers um, that was talking about the fact that a lot of the companies that had been making teething rings and diaper bags and all these things for children um, were noticing a decline in spending on children, but an increase in spending on pets. And so they were actually starting to make those same things towards a pet market. So if you know those blue teething rigs that had the little nubs, it's like a clear blue rubbery plastic. Yep. Those were originally teething rigs for children. <laughs> and they just mark shaped it and marketed it towards pets. Um, why not? Yeah, well, you know, why not? Um, and so I think that What's underlying it, you know, we, we know that there are cross-culturally, even in foraging societies, there are sometimes investments. Um, there's a couple, this, this will be a weird one for everybody. There's a, there's a couple of um, small scale societies where if there's a runt born to a litter of, for example, piglets, one of the women who's currently nursing will also nurse that piglet so that they can get to be fat enough and healthy enough to live and survive and become part of, unfortunately, the food process in that group. Um, but not it's not uncommon that the woman who did the nursing cannot eat that specific piglet. Oh, she sees it differently. She sees it differently. Um, and, you know, we talk, we, for example, um, there's a group of foragers in Africa called Hadzabe. And Hadzabe don't treat dogs and cats the way we think of them here in the U.S., but it's not uncommon for men to pick one who's a favorite and that might actually get a name. Uh, we see this in parts of India. So I think the underlying kind of mechanism and need and bond probably goes deeper and longer into our history. The, the actual packaging of it, though, yes, that's fairly new. Okay. The, thank you for clearing. Uh, what a great response. I, um <laughs> I just kind of threw it out there and I learned so much. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I have just one more follow-up question about, you know, the, the hum human animal bond. You mentioned that, that it was probably there longer than we thought. Is, is it, is it, is there evidence that it's been there for like hundreds and hundreds of years ago or, or is that evidence kind of hard to find historically? Um, well, I will say that there is one of the oldest, um, one of the oldest caves, human caves, human dwellings with cave art in it is in La Chauvet, France, or it's La Chauvet Cave in France, rather. Mm -hmm. And it dates back, estimates are between 32 and 34,000 years ago. And with the exception of some handprints, it's all the animals. It's, it, we've been watching the animals in our environments probably as long as we've been human. Hmm. Well, they, I there, guess they're just, and there's a pair of, po oh, go ahead. Sorry. You no, know, I'm, I'm just thinking like if I'm out in nature and an animal walks by, it's the best day ever. Like I'm going to stare at it. So I'd imagine my yeah. ancestors were much the same. Exactly. Exactly. And canids seem to be a part of that story. In that same cave, there is a series of footprints of an adolescent human. So thinking probably in the realm of eight to 12 and large canid footprints. Whether that was an early dog, whether that was a late wolf, we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that there, there's this pair, this set of prints of human and canid walking together and part of that cave is also really, I think, relevant and telling. There are some people who, who write and insist that, you know, we've been um, bringing animals well before domestication. We've had animals around us in our camps and it would make sense. I love the picture of that, of some, some little kid, well, not a little kid, like a, a, a pre, like a younger teenager, just with a big old wolf loping beside them, you know? Right. They, that's adorable. That, that actually makes my heart feel really good about <laughs> the whole process of our, you know, the, the history of humans with uh, dogs. I love it. Um, so I have another question about your, the, your work, Shelly. Um mm -hmm. So you've written about the co-evolution of how animals communicate during play. And um, I'd like you to explain a little bit of that to our audience, if you could. Okay. Um, this is actually really exciting. And it's a project that it's been in the works for about a year and a half. Um, I will say that we're still working on getting the actual manuscript published. Okay. But I do have it out there in a preprint. 
Um, so in 2001, Patricia Simonet presented her findings at the Amer um, Animal Behavior Society Conference of dog, the dog play pant, which she likened to laughter. Okay. And she'd done a few things with it after that. She's got a paper where she tested its, you know, play, playback of the recordings and their impacts on dogs in the shelters, where she found there was a decrease in barking, um, some of these other things. And at the time, the, inf the, the study got some attention um, for this idea that dogs laugh with us, but unfortunately, it never did it never did the rounds in, you know, the peer review and the journal and all that stuff that science kind of relies on for mm -hmm. validity. Yeah. And so I ended up having a conversation um, on Twitter with my colleagues and um, now co-authors on the paper, and that includes Alexander Horowitz and um, Holly Root Gutteridge. So we were having a conversation on Twitter about the fact that there were some things going on with the rat tickling studies kind of resurfacing. And I commented about the dog laughter and Alexander was like, well, actually it had never gone through peer review. No one's gone back to it. Um, and unfortunately we lost Patricia Simone in the early 2000s. Mm. So with the permission of her um, husband, her widower, we went ahead and got some of the recordings and started looking through them and started recording to our own. So we were actually have video and audio recording of a bunch of different people playing with their dogs and doing other things. Um, and we're finding that dogs do in fact laugh when they're playing with their people. Like a, like uh, a dog version of a laugh? Like a dog version of a laugh. What? So yeah, what, what, right. What is so, that? What does that look like? Do what? you want me to mimic it? I don't know how that's no, going to sound I on people's just, ears. No, I guess that doesn't really <laughs> play on an audio. I'm just, sorry, I'm just a little blown away here. <laughs> so when a dog is panting, like a relaxed pant, it's very rhythmic and it's kind of low volume. And I'm going to do it. And if you need to edit it out, you can edit it out. But so kind of a low volume, you just hear a dog panting, right? <laughs> no okay, big yeah. deal. Yeah. Um, but when a dog is playing and they're getting into a, they throw themselves into a play bow, or they're stomping on a toy, or they're play stomping. We've got recording of this great session of a woman playing with her labradoodle, and she does this thing where she stomps like right next to his paws, but not on his paws, and then he takes his paws and stomps on her feet, and she's <laughs> whispering to him while this is happening, and we could hear him across the yard, but the the play pant ends up having more of this. Oh sound it's not a stand like a steady rhythm and there are these simone defined it as um forced breathy exhalations and they're very loud and they're very pointed and we found in our in our data so far they almost always um align with either one of those play type behaviors or there's a few occasions where there's some tickling you know we, we had this well, we tried to have them do shared rest at the end so that we could get that um that more rhythmic cooling pant and in that what we found was that occasionally we would have a, a play pant come up and we're like what's going on this doesn't fit with our hypothesis well we would go back into the video and sure enough the person was tickling their a flank or the dog was nuzzling into the person and then rolling into their lap and doing all those wonderful things that dogs do. Um, so we're kind of reviving this idea that yes, dogs laugh and we don't know if it's something that they got from wolves. I would love to be able to figure out how to mic up wolves and catch them playing. That would be an interesting study. I don't know that they would handle the microphones very well. Um, but you know, it's, is it that, is it something that, has, you know, we have somehow selected for. So if you think about Brian Hare's work on the pointing, right? Dogs following our pointing task when wolves and chimpanzees don't. Yep. Is it something like that that has come out through, you know, social development with us as a species over these years? Hmm. We don't know. There's all these questions now that we've been able to validate, yes, this is a thing and this is what it looks like on a bioacoustic on a spectrogram. Um, now we get to start doing the fun stuff, which is asking bigger questions about it. That is amazing. So it's like, oh, do 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 most dogs make this 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 laugh pant, it, or is it all dogs? Um, 
Like, what so, uh, that's a good question. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, just so, so, I'm just so fascinated by this. Yeah. No, no, no. So what we've actually, we've got a fairly small sample so far, right? And mm. I, by small, I mean, it's within kind of the norms of a lot of the early behavior work. We've, um, you know, counting the ones that are in the, that are not in the paper that we've gotten at the shelter. Um, we've got like 20 or th- 20 or 25 dogs who do this. Mm. What we are still trying to figure out is how does, and this is going to be a while, but how does the individual um, development and training history and the relationship with the, with the human, um, how are those things having an impact? We do notice, and this is completely anecdotal at this point, but we do notice that the shelter dogs seem to do it less. So there could very definitely be something to do with the level of attachment they feel with their person or just the, the lack of stress and the comfort they feel with people. Um, these are these are all I mean, we're just unpacking this, finding that, yes, we can we can actually identify it and go after it. But um, there's just so many questions to ask about. And I, I think that we're going to find you know, we all know dogs have individual personalities. I think that if if you don't know that by now, I don't know how well you're doing in reading the literature, right? Um, Or even just watching Twitter. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, But it's, there's definitely, there's definitely something to, so when we found this, this look when we or this this image the in the bioacoustics when we found this this point in the spectrogram, um, what we also noticed is that it we have a paper that looks at the what basically the authors call it like the animal nature of the human laugh right, mm-hmm. and when we put them side by side, a lot of the things that are there are very similar. If you get a human laugh that's not super vocal. Right. It's not like a really loud, boisterous laugh, but it's just more of the ha 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 ha. And there's a lot of that that breathiness behind it. Yeah. Um, this the spectrograms look very similar between the two. Okay. So, but we know there's a lot of variation in how humans laugh, right? Oh yes. Um if a dog has been told to be quiet a lot, do they laugh as much? We don't know. There's so I suspect many, no. There's so many questions. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, I have well, I have so many questions. I've got one more. <laughs> I'm looking at my notes here. Um, so, how did you record the dogs? Did, were they wearing headsets? Did they look like telemarketers, or did you have like a big boom mic kind of over top, like you were shooting a documentary? I just have to share the fact that I am now imagining Bunsen wearing a headset. We put um, him before he's adorable. <laughs> So we, what we ended up doing is we used wireless microphone kits. Um, so it's a, it's a body pack that has the battery and transmitter and then a wireless microphone that plugs into that. And that whole thing then sends data to a receiver that we can plug into an audio recorder. And they they so the wore person, this in their body or what? Like, uh... Well, in most cases, the dogs were already like – they usually wore a harness or a thunder shirt or something yeah. of the, that nature. So we were able to attach it to that. We, oh, we, we attach it to the harness and then bring the mic around towards the front by the front of their collar so that we could pick up their vocals, their vocalizations. Cause some of these you don't really hear until you see the actually look at the audio. Um, there were a couple instances where we ended up having to actually use like a, the stretchy athletic um, wrap and actually just wrap it like right behind their front legs and then attach the bike pack that way. But in most cases, there was some sort of equipment the dog was already comfortable with that we could then clip the mic pack to or otherwise adhere it to. Sometimes we had to strap it on uh, and then put the mic on them. That's and cool. then, of course, we'd set up the video camera, too, because what good is the audio if you don't have the video to show how how goofy they're being? I love it. How much you must have hours of dogs doing this like. Um, We're definitely getting there. <laughs> uh, most sessions, most sessions last about 15 to 20 minutes. By the time we 
kind of walk through some training, right? They, we ask them to do some training cues so that their dog can just kind of get focused on, oh, we're, we're together now, right? Mm-hmm. And then they play, which might be for some dogs, you know, older dogs, they play for two minutes and they're done. For some of the younger dogs that we saw, they would play for 10 and still not be done. Like we'd move into the, at the end, we would do some shared rest so we can capture that, that normalized pant. Mm. Um, And they were still like, no, play with me, play with me. And so we'd have to wait for them to settle before we could start actually timing. Um, But yeah, I mean, right now we've probably, we're probably cracking 10 hours worth of recordings. And, And again, that's just the start. Our goal is to actually do 100 recordings of bonded pairs and 100 recordings at the shelter to see if we can really find some of the nuances as well as some of the the broader themes. I have two more questions before we move on. Um, Okay. The first one, and and I think the first one is when, when you started to notice there was a pattern, was that like a big moment for your team? Like I can't yes. imagine. Yeah. Wow. What <laughs> What did that feel like? Um. When your hypothesis ends up being correct, when you start getting data that says you're onto something, you're not imagining it. There is an electrifying joy. Hmm. I mean, right now, just thinking about the moment that we realized, yes, this is really here. I've got goosebumps because um, it's just you put a lot into developing projects. You put a lot into refining what's working, what's not working, figuring out, Mm -hmm. um, you know, how to adjust to different pairs of, of participants and these kinds of things. And so there's always a moment when you start the analysis where you're like, okay, here it is. Is it, are we right? Are we wrong? Um, And I don't know, finding out that it was really there was, exciting and also a little bit validating. Um, So our Beagle Mix, Calvin, who we lost a few years back, um, he was one of the thing, he was one of the reasons behind this for me in the fact that he and my partner would play doggy jokes. So my partner would go kind of hide around the corner or um, drop down onto all fours all of a sudden. And then, you know, Calvin would kind of rush up to him and they'd sit there and kind of like, play stomp at each other and posture. And then Calvin would do this thing where he'd like bump into my partner's shoulder and start laughing. (laughs) And they'd be like, oh, that's a funny doggy joke, isn't it? And never really thought a whole lot about it um, until I started to really think and, and watch all these different groups playing together. And I'm like, man, this is really, this is really something. Hmm. Um, and I know, you know, Alexandra has done a lot of work. She did a, a citizen science paper in 2016, I think it was, um, looking at people sending in videos of them playing with their dogs. And she's got that same kind of thing, like sitting there and watching. I mean, there's, I get to say that I play with dogs for science and I watch people play with their dogs for science. <laughs> um, and there's there's a joy behind it. I think so much of our, our research into other species as well as our own existence is based on you know we use fear we we see if other and you know if do dogs respond to conspecific whines and barks and cries Mm -hmm. um do humans respond so much of this work is based on fear and i understand where that comes from but at the same point um the other cool thing about this is we were able to show like we can study something fun and joyful yeah. And still tap into those themes of evolved communication and social contagion. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's exciting. I love it. Do you, my last question, and this is like a big one, um, and you may not have an answer. Uh, <laughs> if, if dogs have a laugh, would you be able to extrapolate that to other domesticated animals potentially also having their own version of a laugh? What do you think about that? Oh boy. Have have you been asked this before? Have you thought about this before? I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, So Winkler, let me hold on a second because I've got the paper handy. Winkler and Bryant um, have a paper on play vocalizations. So it's play vocalizations and human laughter, a comparative review. And 
they kind of tap into this by looking and they found evidence, I think it was 65 mammal species. There's some sort of documentation, even if it's a, a case study or an anecdote um, or something like Simone's work on dogs, uh, showing that, you know, there's there's this definite thing that mammals have some sort of play vocalization. Yeah. And that makes sense to me, because if you look at the, the data on chimps and dogs and canid, or, um, coyotes and wolves and you know, all these different primates and horses, play has a purpose, right? Yeah. Play teaches us a lot of skills we need as an adult. Um, so the starry-eyed scientist in me says, yes, we're going to find that cats can have some sort of play vocalization, some sort of laugh. Horses, um, you know, cows, pigs, goats, because goats are tricky 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 little friends <laughs> <laughs> we had them when i was growing up yeah they're pretty, um, they're uh they are mischievous yes they're very mischievous um now the scientist in me has to say we you know dogs are one of the few domesticated species we've tested mm -hmm. we know that rats have something like a chirp that occurs at a really high frequency when they're being tickled and played with um, so if, if the range of rat to dog to chimp to human all have some sort of play, pant, laugh vocalization, um, I struggle to think that it's not going to be common. Gotcha. <clears throat> well, but of we'll, course, there isn't the data because we've got a lot of companion species, a lot of pet species to study, a lot of domesticated species to study. I won't hold that. I won't hold you to that. I just thought I would throw it out there. <laughs> Um, Shelly, this is, that's so cool talking about your research. Um, can we move on to the other standard questions yeah. on the podcast? Okay, perfect. Absolutely. So we've been talking about, uh, do your research with dogs. Um, we have a couple standard questions that we ask our, our guests and one is for the pet story. It's a story about a pet from their life. Do you have a pet story you could share with us? I do. And this goes back to when I was very, very, very young. Okay. <laughs> So my mom actually, um, when she was pregnant with me, she brought home a German Shepherd puppy um, about two months before she had me. She wanted to have the dog in the home and kind of accustomed to being around everybody and trained and socialized in time for, for, for me not having to you know spin as many plates or whatever. <laughs> so um, his name was Mac. And Mac and I were best friends. Oh. Um, we shared our, you know, when the ice cream truck would come through the neighborhood, doesn't that date me? Uh, but when, when the ice cream truck would come through the neighborhood, I always got a, those orange push pops. Yep. And he always shared them with me. It'd be like two licks for me and a lick for him. <laughs> and my mom gave up trying to tell me not to do it because I would sneak them when she wasn't looking otherwise. <laughs> um, but she always likes to tell the story and I vaguely remember the actual event because I would walk around with my hand, like I would hold Max collar and we would just walk around all over the place. Um, we'd walk off into this like field behind our, our uh, yard or walk down the street. And so she got a phone call one day from one of the neighbors and they're just like, do you know your little girl is walking that dog with no supervision? <laughs> and my mom's response is like, she couldn't be any safer. Yes, right? because he was he and I were just so, so close, so bonded um, to the point that when I was 11 and we had to put him down because he had such horrible hip dysplasia, mm. my mom actually let me stay home from school for two days because I was so upset, crying, broken hearted. I just like it was like a part of me had been pulled away. Um, and that stays with me even now when I think about, OK, when the time comes for Lucy and all these kinds of things. So, mm. yeah, it's. It's one of those, of course, you know, when I told my mom I was having dogs and not kids, she was like, of course. <laughs> so. <laughs> Makes sense. Oh, what a touching story. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing better than watching kids interact with dogs, I think. Yeah. It's super yeah. sweet. Um, if you follow Bunsen and Beaker, maybe you saw that we took them to this sign center and they did a meet and greet with a ton of kids and the kids were just like just loving the, the Bunsen and Beaker. And I just was like hanging back, taking a video of just them interacting with these, my two dogs. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, thanks for sharing your your story. That's pretty yeah. pretty adorable. The other standard question is the super fact, and it's something that you know that when you tell people, it blows them away a bit. And and I am blown away by most of what we've talked about today so far. Do you have anything left in the in the trunk for us for this one? So there was a study out. This isn't my own, but dogs actually process language the same way we do. I, I really think that. If dogs had vocal, if they had vocal cords, they would be talking to us because um, there's been a couple of studies now that they process content, context, and emotion, that kind of valence of what we're saying in separate parts of their brain, very similar to we do. Wow. Okay. So, so when you say, you know, if you say come in a very happy, joyful, playful tone, they know something good's probably going to happen when I get there. But if you say come or come here in that very stern, angry voice, of course, they're not coming closer. Because <laughs> they they get the inflection, even though they understand. Mm-hmm. The uh-huh. mm-hmm. They are like toddlers. They are like toddlers. <laughs> My other one is always just thinking about the size of their oaf. So there's a, a part of the brain that helps us receive scent and then process it. And the it's called the um, olfactory bulb and ours is extremely small, like the size of a pea. And if you think about how big a human brain is, that's pretty, that's pretty small Um, dogs in comparison. So an average size dog, say like a Labrador or somebody um, theirs is probably the size of a walnut. And if you think about how much more percentage wise, you know, ratio wise it is to the brain, that's pretty, that's a pretty distinct, no wonder their noses are their eyes, right? Yeah, I love that. Uh, the one the one thing that I, I read uh, recently is their the nose and their eyes are linked to the brain. So um, yes. did you see that? Do you see that? I did see that. that is? So that when they smell, yes. they see the smell or something like a mixture of smell and sight probably is mm-hmm. processed in their brain. And yeah. we can't even comprehend what that would be, right? Like that's... No. It's incomprehensible to smell a sea or see a smell. <laughs> now, unrelated to dogs, something I just recently learned is that the mantis shrimp mm-hmm. has 12 different colored, 12 different wavelengths of light cones in their eyes. So we're typically what's called a trichromat, which means we have three. Yeah. And a dog usually is called a dichromat. They have two. So mm-hmm. they see even less color. And a mantis shrimp has 12. So what are they seeing? everything <laughs> the different. author the author said that they are they likely see in all spectrums of light and they may even they like, have something akin to seeing radio waves what yeah when science is awesome so confusing if you saw radio <laughs> waves they'd be everywhere yeah oh my goodness <laughs> That, you know, if if dogs could talk, that would really help with my audio book that I'm making for text from Bunsen, because then Bunsen and Beaker could just voice themselves. But here we are. <laughs> well, the last section of the podcast is a fun one. We get to know a little bit more about our guest. And um, you wanted to uh, talk in the important to you section about um, one health. Did I get that yes. right? Yes. Yes. Um, so take it away, Doc. What's what's your passion about that? So One Health originated as a concept in physical health, medical, you know, the medical profession. And the idea that we are all connected, you know, human health impacts um, our companion animals and wildlife impacts human health. And the past couple of years have really shown us that, right? We We've have this pandemic that raged across the planet, but it's also found its way into wildlife. Mm. So um, white-tailed deer, I know they were really being kind of watched for a while and um, people were concerned with companion animals a little bit. And we had, you know, issues with tigers and all this kind of thing. So it, it started out as this biological concept, but realistically with how much we're learning about the behavioral, the emotional, the cognitive of other species, Um, It really is a total wellness idea. Um, And the the idea here is that everything is connected and we are all connected. And our our choices, even if they don't seem to immediately, they impact each other. Um, And so by extension to that, right, I'm always worried about um, 
overconsumption or how that impacts our dogs. And it's tough because, of course, we all want to get all the toys. And then we wonder why they don't play with half the toys we get them. Um, um, we have a but, subscription to BarkBox and we have enough toys for about 17 dogs now. So, <laughs> right? And see, I'm the kind of person who'd be like, okay, what aren't you guys playing with? And what can I take to the shelter? Because they're exactly. always looking for stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just this idea, really step back and think about how we're connected to everything. Um, our our decision to squash that spider has an impact on what other species become, you know, start to start to thrive in our garden or um, our decision to bike instead of, of drive. How does that impact? And it's not to say, and I'm not one of these people who's going to be like, we should all live like monks because that's just not feasible in our, our world. Right. Mm. Um, but just be thinking I'm, I'm moving into this idea. So we all know about our carbon footprint, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm really trying to put forward this idea of a cruelty footprint. Right. Mm. Can you choose cruelty-free medications? Well, no. Medications have to be tested on somebody. It's just the way, you know, we prioritize. Um, but do you really, you know, could you look into whether or not your your shampoo might be cruelty-free, right? Or was it tested on somebody? And if so, who? Um, those little changes can go a long way into the wellness for everybody. And that goes for our dogs. It goes for our cats. It goes for our children and our spouses and our coworkers and our neighborhood. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my important to me thing is that I just really think, um, we all need to spend time once in a while looking at the bigger picture and where our fingerprint or our cruelty footprint might be. I have never heard of that before, but that's pretty profound. Um, Thank you. I was, <clears throat> I follow an account on Twitter that tracks the rich and how they fly. Right. And there's like some mm -hmm. shocking revelations. I don't know if you've seen like some of the things, like some of the super rich people are taking like a flight that you could drive in less time that you could fly. And they yeah. just have this like enormous carbon footprint, but it's, it's good to think about a cruelty footprint as well. Um, do shampoos say, do they, will they be marketed cruelty free? Like, is that something people can look at? I'm just not sure. Um, Sometimes. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, it's not something you know. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It's, it's definitely something I know. Okay. okay. So sometimes um, a lot of products, whether it be your laundry soap or your shampoo or your dishwasher detergent, um, they, they will often have on there, it may say something like not tested on animals, or there may be a leaping bunny logo or some other sort of cruelty free logo. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I think it's method says tested on humans, not on people. There's a couple of, there's a couple of um, companies that are like, we'd use things that we already know are safe in different formulations. And so we don't have to test them on other species. Oh, okay. But, so they're kind of like using previous research and not like reinventing the wheel and having to right. test it all over again. Oh. Right. Um, like Ricky Gervais said, do we, you know, do we really need to put shampoo in a rabbit's eyes to know if it's going to hurt? You know, like shampoo hurts your eyes, period. <laughs> right. Um, and you can edit that out if it's too graphic, but uh there's there's an app. So the Beagle Freedom Project is an amazing organization because their goal is to try to legislate changes in the way that animal research is done, as well as what happens to animals when the research is over. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of their a lot of their well, actually all of the dogs that they um, put up for adoption either came from a laboratory or they came from the meat trade in Asia. They do a lot of that, too. Um, but their whole idea is, you know, unless something has happened during the research that makes it, you know, nearly impossible for that dog to live a healthy life, why can't they be adopted out when they've served their time? Yeah. Right. And then in the meantime, what can we do to minimize? Um, so in research with animal subjects, there's this, idea, there are three R's it's reduce, refine. What's the last one? Replace, reduce, refine, replace. Um, so what can we do to use fewer animals? And that's part of the One Health, right? Because thinking about where those products came from um, or thinking about how we know certain things about the mammalian heart, whatever, uh, is, is really relevant and really important. And so they have um, 
this app called Cruelty Cutter. And that's really where I started. It's It's got a scanner in it. So you can just open the app up and you take a picture of the UPC code on whatever, or barcode on whatever it is you're thinking about buying. And it will tell you whether or not the research shows, yes, this is a cruelty-free product or no, we don't know. Or, hey, you know, this is a cruelty-free product, maybe, but they're owned by this other organization that tests on animals. Um, there's, a, there's a range of possibilities. And then you can make an informed decision um, on whether or not you still want to purchase that product or find an alternative. And I'll tell you that initially I would think, I used to think like, oh, but everything that's going to be cruelty free is going to be this like super hippie. It's just an oil instead of a soap kind of stuff or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but in reality, there's a lot of great products that are in fact cruelty free. Hmm. And what's the name of that app again? Cruelty Cutter. And it is on iOS and Android. Okay, awesome. Um, I think I'm, I might put a link of, to that in the show notes. That'd be great. Well, t- Doc, thanks for talking to us about your passion for One Health. Um, it's pretty profound. Uh, made me think about some stuff. And and that's what conversations are all about. We learned some really cool things about dogs. And, and I think you've left us pondering how... If we love animals so much, we can help them out a bit more, maybe. We're at the end of the interview. Uh, Thank you so much for coming to the Science Podcast and chatting with us about your research. Can people find you on social media? Is there there a place that people can check out what you do? You can go to Twitter, and my handle is ShellyVPHD. I thought I was really smart when I graduated from grad school, and now I wish I'd have changed it. (laughs) (laughs) We'll make sure there's a link to your uh, your profile in the show notes as well. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, it's time for story time with me, Adam. If you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks. Dad, do you have a story? Yes. Um, I don't know how much of it I should tell, so I'll tell my perspective of the story. So we... W- when does this podcast come out boy the days are all blurred together (laughs) on thursday we were invited to the telus world of science with bunsen and beaker um i was to give a talk about social media kindness and empathy and then bunsen and beaker were there for a meet and greet chris came and adam you came and your girlfriend annalise and um really it was awesome to have everybody there because i couldn't have done it by myself at all there was no way um, so from from my perspective, it was uh, it was really surreal. I I thought for my talk, I would have like eight people. <laughs> like I literally thought eight or nine people would show up, and it was standing room only. There was like I don't know how many people fit in that stage area, but it was it was packed. There was no room for people to sit. There's people standing outside and listening. So I had a good audience and I talked about everything that we do with Bunsen and Beaker social media account, the science podcast, this thing that you're listening to. Um, and I gave my perspective on how important it is to tell people about science through the lens of empathy and also the trick of cuteness. So if, Bunsen and Beaker were handled by Chris and Adam and Annalise because they're not going to sit for my talk the whole time. And then we had some really fun fan um, meet and greets (laughs) with Bunsen and Beaker during the event. Maybe Adam and Chris will talk about that. I don't want to steal it away from them. And then Marla, who is Kuno's mistress, um, dog mom, uh, Kuno the service Roddy, she was there and uh, Bunsen was a little excited and, and ran up to see Kuno. We got away from us a little bit. So I, f- I felt bad about that. But then what was really cool is that we worked with the two dogs together and then they were buddies by the end of it, which was really cute. So that's my story. Um, I actually could tell a story about the event because I, w- I had Bunsen for most of it. Um, he's, the, Bunsen, he's the Groot. <laughs> yeah. Bunsen was the Groot. We would walk three steps and then get stopped for pictures and people wanted to talk to him and people were very nice. Um, They wanted to talk to him? But the cool thing was that not only did Bunsen tolerate people, like he usually tolerates people and he doesn't usually have a problem with people, um, but he sometimes gets a bit 
fed up and burnt out in, in terms of people just because he's not like Beaker where Beaker absolutely loves people all of the time, every of the time, always people. <laughs> Bunsen sometimes likes to keep to himself and be a bit shy and a little bit aloof. But no, at the event, he was perfect. There, He was very happy with everyone and got pets from everybody. Um, Beaker was distracted by the shadows, so Bunsen was an even more people person than Beaker was, which was surprising because <laughs> Beaker was too concerned about the little lines moving on the ground when people walked around. But yeah, Bunsen did amazing, did better than I thought he would. Um, but yeah, that's my story. Mom, do you have a story? I sure do. My story ties in right to the beginning of the event that we went to. When we got to Edmonton, we got out of the vehicle. Uh, the dogs were excited, but they really had no ex- idea about what was going to happen. They're like, oh, we're just going on a road trip. This is fun. And then when we got in the building, it's like, click. Something clicked in Bunsen and Beaker that they were like, oh, this is like what we did before. I when know. They did- yeah, like they, it was like they recognized it right away and their behavior changed to, oh, a little bit of working mode. This is what we're doing. This is going to be so fun. Um, and that was amazing. So that's my story from this week. Um, they were so excited. Beaker was like so excited in the car um, going up. And then when we got on our way home, both dogs were so tired. They were like, emotionally de- exhausted. <laughs> they were they were done. Except this is the funny thing. Normally we take out one of the seats in the van for more space for the dogs, but we had Annalise with us of course. So we had all of the seats in and the back seats were you had down, so there should have been room for the dogs to sprawl out in the back of the van like a mansion back there for them. No, no, they wanted to be squished up between the people and they're <laughs> It was a little. It was a little cramped, to say the yeah, least. Benson's not small. When he lies down, he takes up the entire floor. Yes, and so when we dropped Annalise off, Bunsen took up her whole seat. He's, <laughs> he's like, finally, big. I get my whole he's, seat back. He's as big as a person. He's as big as a person. Anyway, that's my story. I, I do want to add something that was so, like, heartwarming and surreal and. Like I've been thinking about it all day and that's people that, that came up to us and, and like, like told us they followed Bunsen and Beaker and how much it meant to them, like what we do. And like Chris and I are just normal people. We just post kind content and we talk about science and it was very rewarding. And if you were one of the people that came up to talk to us about what we do on Twitter and like specific things that you, you like that we did like, boy, that was, that was very, very cool. I have to say, and, and very heartwarming. And some people gave us like a little thoughtful gifts. So thank you so much to those people. Yeah. Cause like the people gave us like thumbs up. They were like, your content is cool. And I thought that was really nice. <laughs> um, but yeah. I thought it was really fun to go to the event and I thought people were super, super nice at the event and, you know, I had a fun time. You like the snacks. I did like the snacks. That is for sure. Oh yeah. We had a, we had a, we had like a little private green room, like pseudo celebrities and they had like a little snack (laughs) spread put out for us and the snacks were delicious. They were really good. The croissant, the brownies, the fruits. There were brownies. I didn't get any brownies. Uh, the brownies were kind of mid, not going to lie. Not, not the best brownies I've ever had, but they were, they were good enough to, to tide me over for the event. (laughs) Um, but yeah, that is story time. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast, uh, this episode. And thank you if you came to the event. Um, yeah. Um, bye-bye. That's the end of another science podcast episode. Thanks for coming back every week to listen to our show. Special thanks to Dr. Shelley Volsh, who talked to us about the play pant in dogs. Now that is a cool, cool story. We'd also like to give a shout out to the adult dog tier on the Paw Pack Plus. Take it away, Chris. Elizabeth Bourgeois, Peggy McKeel, Mary LaMagna Ryder, Helen Chin, Holly Burge, Sandy Brimer, Brenda Clark, Andrew Lynn, Marianne McNally, Karen Beth St. George, 
Catherine Jordan, Tracy Domingu, Diane Allen, Julie Smith, Terry Adam, Shelley Smith, Jennifer Smathers, Laura Stephenson, Tracy Leanbaugh, Courtney Proven, Fun Lisa, Ben Rathert, Jody Ogren, Brianne Haas, Bianca Hyde, Debbie Anderson, Anne Uchida, Donna Craig, Amy C., Susan Wagner, Kathy Zerker, and Liz Button. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Uh, <laughs>